Joining us all the way from the United Kingdom, please give a warm welcome to Polly Sampson. So Polly, let's start off a little bit about your upbringing and kind of how your career started. So tell me about that journey to becoming a writer. Where did you decide as a student or as a child that writing was what you were going to pursue? Um, I, I'd never decided um, uh, to write because I always wrote. Um, and it wasn't until I had my own children, and some of them write and some of them, you know, not such ready writers. But when I had my own children, I sort of, they aged about five, and I was thinking, well, where are all these little stories and poems? And, you know, waiting for this eruption of writing that never happened. And I then realized that it was just something in me, and it was something I'd always done. And so there wasn't a, a, a sort of blinding flash where I decided to be a writer. It was just a natural progression. Progression, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's bits and pieces of your family history that shows up in both of the collections and the novel as well. Kind yeah. of, is there a particular story that inspired you for a certain passage, or you have a rich so, family history yeah, that just well. <laughs> learning about is fascinating? I'm sure for the audience, it's a great well. Um, my family history. Um, for those who don't know, my parents um, were both refugees into England in 1938. My mother was six at the time, half Chinese coming from Shanghai, fleeing the Japanese. And my father, who was 10 at the time, um, came from Hamburg on the kinder transport. Um, I mean, obviously, they didn't meet then. They had very different journeys. My, my father, there was a large Jewish family that embraced him, and he you know, went on to study and become a journalist. My mother, unfortunately, ended up in an orphanage. And at the age of 16, took herself back to China to find her father. She didn't find her father, but she found a revolution. And she joined Mao's army and for 10 years was in Red China um, until eventually she got out again. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot there for me to rich. draw on. And I don't directly write about their, their histories, but it certainly informs a lot that I do. Yeah, um, along that journey of writing uh, between novelists, between short stories, Obviously, there's a different process that's involved. Um, mentally, you need to change the way you're going to write. Can you tell me a little bit about that transition between the different writing styles, between lyrics, between yeah. um, if there's major events kind of that drove you again in one of these directions, or this is when you decide I'm done with my first novel and now I'm going to work on short stories, now I'm going to try lyrics. Kind of how did that begin? No, it's it's uh, again. I think every every story finds its medium. Um, writing a short story. Is, is, is almost simpler because you can keep the whole idea in your head without feeling like your brain is going to explode. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's very containable. Um, it goes very well with having small children, actually, because you don't need to write anything down, but you've got this whole other secret world and you're sort of wandering around doing the rest of your life and kind of writing and editing so that by, by the time I write a short story, it's like typing. Yeah. You know, it's, I've worked on it so much in my head, but. With a novel, you know, your brain would explode if you tried to keep a whole novel in yeah. your head in that way. So that you have to be more, in a way, more rigorous. You have to sit at your desk every day and, yeah. and work on it. And certainly towards the end of writing a novel, there's a sort of feeling of mounting panic that you really don't want to leave your desk at all. I can remember when I was writing my first novel and, you know, the family kind of knew to leave me alone in the later stages of it. And um, there was a sort of knock at the door and it was my husband and he said, um, we need to go to parents' evening. And I said, why do I have to go to parents' evening? And he said, you're a parent? <laughs> <laughs> so that gets a little obsessional. Um, and then lyric writing is different again, because I'm not drawing entirely on something in me. I've got this wonderful prompt, which is that the music comes first. Yeah. So lyric writing, again, it takes place mainly when I'm walking, much less sitting at the desk. Yeah. And I, have, I do one song at a time, and I have a track in my in my earphones and it's playing and playing and playing and and I often do that I think it's you know often referred to as the Paul McCartney method you know scrambled eggs was yeah. yesterday and I start to make up something and then gradually some sort of meaning will emerge and yeah, yeah so it's, it's it's miles on the feet for, yeah. for a song as well yeah. so even within the kindness I think there are entire chapters that on their own could be a short story did you find yourself picking up pieces that you didn't include in perfect lives or in other kind of collections you were working on that you then incorporated in and changed the characters or? No, not really. Do you I, have I, a stash that you keep somewhere <laughs> I of wish. material I want to? <laughs> I really wish I did. I don't, I, I don't actually. Um, the kindness started life in a different format. Um, 
I was feeling quite militant about short stories because publishers, certainly in the UK, I think it's different in the US, but in the UK, there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, oh, you know, short stories don't sell. Yeah. And so I, my last collection had been a collection of linked short stories. And so I thought, well, I'll take this one stage further. I'll do a novella. And at the end of the novella, my main character, Julian, um, would have an explosion of creativity and within that, he would write some short stories that would show that he's come to some sort of realisation of the, the, the events of his life that he hadn't understood in the novella. And so I did start The Kindness by writing his short stories and then very quickly realised that however militant I felt about short stories, it was better to get the novel right and that it needed to be a novel. And yeah. things find their form and that demanded to be a novel. Yeah. You mentioned about your creative process, walking, kind of, for you, where do you find that inspiration? Is it just walking the dog outside, taking in the air, yeah. sitting in your study? You've mentioned a few different things. Yeah. Um, well, I can't sit and stare at a blank screen because I find that really agitating, and I don't know how anyone does that. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people who will say writing is about fixing the bum to the seat. Well, I don't really agree with that. I think, you know, I've got a really grateful dog, he, he's very keen on this idea that writing is about doing about, you know, 10 miles walking a day. And I think that if you walk and you're thinking about it, and I often do something called method writing, where I walk as my character. And whatever's happening, I see it through my character's eyes. And, you know, it can be quite embarrassing at times, you know, because, you know, my main character in The Kindness is, is a man called Julian. Yeah. You know, women are coming towards me and I'm Julian and I'm giving them the once over. And, <laughs> Because I really convinced myself that I am that character. And um, by the time you get back to the desk, it yeah. does, it flows. You know, if you've, yeah. put the, if you've put the miles in on your feet and you've really managed to think about it and you've really got under the skin of that character, yeah. there's no trouble once you get back to your desk. To Is there, I know we've talked, you write sometimes about the inspiration. Are there particular authors that have influenced you a lot? Um, a particular time period in writing, yeah. whether it's... UK literary history, American literary history, other parts of the world where you're drawing yeah. short stories and yeah. fables that have been strung together. For you, who are those kind of well, muses? My main inspiration probably came from, I worked in publishing in the 1980s in, in the UK, and I worked for a company called Jonathan Cape, which was the literary publisher, and it was run by a total genius called Tom Matchler. And, you know, I mean, he invented the Booker Prize, for example. He published, you, na you name some great authors. He, you know, Martin Amis, Ian McEwan, Nadine Gordimer, Doris Lessing, Bruce Chatwin, uh, Margaret Atwood, Salman Rushdie. You know, yeah. I mean, it was just ridiculous, our list. You know, it yeah. was a wonderful place to work. And it meant that I read really, really great books f for my job. It yeah. was, you know... It was heavenly. And so I think that that period of literature has been very influential because I read so much of it. And nowadays, I, I still read a lot of my contemporaries, but I'm having a sort of real moment of catching up with the Victorians. And, yeah. and I'm loving it, actually. It's, you know, it's good yeah. to go back. It's good to, to, to go back. There's so much great stuff in every period. And then poetry, when, when I'm writing fiction, I don't read fiction. Yeah. But I start every day by reading really good poetry and different poets for different books. I mean, uh, Perfect Lives, I read a lot of um, Neruda, yeah. strangely. And for um, The Kindness, I started with one of my favorite poets, W.B. Yeats, and then very quickly realized that I really needed to get into John Milton because I'd made Julian yeah. a Milton scholar. So I spent a year reading Paradise Lost, which yeah. was not a year lost to me. It was a wonderful year. Um, and then another poet who I adore is a contemporary poet called David Wevel, who I think he's, I don't know how well known he is, but he is amazing. And I, yeah. I, I'd say that if anyone's looking for a contemporary poet, he lives in Texas, I think. He's probably in his 80s by now. Yeah. He has published since the early 60s consistently not a bad word flows from his pen. Yeah. Just incredible stuff. You just mentioned Paradise Lost. I yeah. think there are overt references. There are references that you would have had to read the kind of whole story together. For you, was that the driving factor in your, I know you mentioned you don't organize it kind of in a web, yeah. but how did you decide where to weave in Paradise Lost or 
did you have a schema or an outline for you that you said these are references? Mm -hmm. I know Zephyr. I know yeah. there's Lucifer. Yeah. He's a scholar. Yeah, it just it just gave me a feeling of glee while I was writing because yeah. it's it's a kind of secret layer in the book yeah. because actually I think there are very few people who really know Paradise Lost. Yeah, here it's required reading. I think and in I think middle that, school, high school, yeah. and then people forget about it. <laughs> and I think in England it's 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 also required reading. And I think there's nothing like required reading to put people off a writer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, so I was lucky, you know. I'm, I I I I have no formal education, so I came to it on my own. Yeah. And it was a joy because it takes you off into so many areas, you know, labyrinthine kind yeah. of footnotes. If you, get, if you get the Longman edition, which has amazing notes, I mean, it, the classical references, the biblical references, it's an education all on its own, as well as being the most extraordinary piece of writing. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 sorry, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think you answered it, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> um, and along with that, I think the research, I know you do a lot of research going into your yeah. novels. For you, this novel took a little bit longer to write, kind of, why did it take longer this time? Was it the research that you were doing differently? Are you researching characters specifically? Yeah. Or you come up with an idea for a plot and then decide, if I research this, it'll become a lot more yeah. concrete and descriptive. Well, I think, um, I think I could blame YouTube for, for some product. of the time that it took, because <laughs> of course it is the you know it is the perfect writer's resource. You yeah. know, you don't have to go and wander around Amsterdam. You can just go onto YouTube and you yeah. can find that that street and you can find lovely clips of it. And it it really does help enormously. I mean, another thing that YouTube was brilliant for when I was writing this novel was there's a scene and it's quite a pivotal scene where my character Julian gets to see, he has a friend who's a medical student, and he gets to, to see his sperm under the microscope. And I wanted to write this piece, and I wanted to write it, you know, I didn't want to just write, and they look like tadpoles. I wanted yeah. to kind of get something more out of this scene because it's such an important scene. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go to a fertility clinic, or yeah. what am I going to do? And then eventually I went, YouTube, there'll be a scientist, He'll have posted some sperm under the microscope, so you know, so a little bit of trepidation. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the search, and what came up was very surprising and very helpful, which is that a lot of young men seem to like to make films of their sperm <laughs> under the microscope and post them onto YouTube and play a guitar solo <laughs> with them. So, hooray for those men! So yeah, I got to write that passage with plenty of input from YouTube, and it yeah. was it was great. Uh, really and then <laughs> timing wise, right? I think you had other events going in your life that you worked on it for a bit, yeah. put it aside, came back. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the reason it took my first novel to first draft took six weeks and this one to first draft took over a year. And I think really the main difference was that with my first novel I had a lot of small children. Yeah. So it was like, you know, I've got to get it done, I've got to get it done. You know, I'm really meant to be doing something else here, I've got to get this done. And you know, I was able to take my time with my second novel, and you know, it's a luxury. Yeah. It's a luxury to take your time. It's good. Shifting gears a bit, uh, we've talked a lot about the kindness. For the perfect lives, kind of, I found it very fascinating the way you've structured the story. It is not necessarily a linear kind of plot line. The characters are again weaving in and out of each other's lives. For you, kind of, where did that idea and inspiration well, come from? It was. Um, it was. It was never planned. And yeah. nothing I ever write seems to be planned. Yeah. Um, everything takes on a life of its own. And with Perfect Lives, it really was that I wrote one story, and then I wrote another story. And what happened, for example, the reason that the characters kept emerging was they kept kind of a character who was a minor character in one story. I'd come to write the next story, and this character would be sticking the hand up. Yeah. Me, 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 write about me. And so, for example, the first story I wrote was called Barcarolle, and is about a piano tuner who has terrible, he, he, he was supposed to be a concert pianist and then yeah. stage fright did for him. And it's during his day as a piano tuner, he meets a lot of pianos and a lot of people. So I'd written that story and then I knew that the next story I wanted to write was inspired by, um, on my husband's last tour, the On an Island tour, we went to Hamburg, which is where my Jewish family were from. And I was standing at the back of the stage while the audience were sort of screaming for an encore and I had a really unhealthy conflicted feeling I had to keep saying it's not them it's not them. But there was something about these people shouting that gave me the chills and I yeah. wanted to express 
that second-hand memory thing. You know, nothing happened to me, but it happened to my ancestors. Yeah. And they didn't do anything, but maybe their ancestors did. And it's, it's a very difficult emotion. Um, and so I wanted to explore that. And so I knew that I was going to have a musician, and I knew she was going to be Jewish, and I knew she was going to go to Hamburg, and she was going to play, and she was going to have those feelings. And so I was thinking, well, maybe I'll make her a pianist. Mm, yeah, OK. Oh, who is she? And then I sort of thought back to the story I'd just written, and there was just a minor character in there called, whose piano was being tuned, called Aurelia Lieberman. I thought, Lieberman? She's obviously yeah. Jewish. Yeah. And so that's really how one emerges from another. It, mm -hmm. It's really not planned, and then it gets to be fun. You know, once yeah. you're a few stories in, you do, you start looking for them and thinking, I'm going to tell your story. Yeah. And it's, it's great, actually. It's really, really yeah. a lovely form, I think, the link short story form. I'm a huge fan of link short stories yeah. anyway. I mean, I love Elizabeth, Elizabeth Strout's yeah. Olive Kitteridge, and, um, and, I, and I love, there's a book by Daniel Kelman called Fame, yeah. which is, again, link stories, wonderful. I, yeah. yeah I, it's a good form. You yeah. touched upon the piano uh, and piano tuner. The piano seems to manifest itself in almost every story. <laughs> kind of for you, what is that symbolism? Is it from well, your own musical yeah, background that you want to use that as the main motif? Or? Yes. Well, what happened was um, I had three sons and, and I wrote and, and then I had a princess and I also knew she was going to be my last baby. So I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to write because of having this rather obsessive personality you know writing kind of blots out children while I'm yeah. doing it and I thought I'm really going to just enjoy my children and particularly my last child I'm not going to write I'm not going to write and a couple of my boys were learning the piano and when they had to do their piano practice you know like lots of boys there didn't seem to be anything you could do to persuade them to sit down and do that yeah. practice and so I said to their piano teacher would it help if if, if I learnt and then yeah. at least I could be helpful and she said, yeah, that, that, you know, that sounds like a good idea. But the thing is, I am quite a geek. Yeah. So as soon as I started learning, I kind of took it on. And I, I was spending the sort of hours I could have been writing, learning the piano. I mean, I was playing the piano for five hours a day. The children yeah. would come home and they'd say, I need to do my piano practice. Said, Sorry, you know, I'm <laughs> doing mine right now. Took all the exams. I was like a child prodigy, you know, yeah. rose up through the, um, <laughs> through the levels. And yeah, kept, kept on taking the exams, kept on playing the piano. But it's not my thing. Yeah. And so when it came to the moment when my daughter then went to nursery school and I knew that it was time to start writing again, I was just absolutely soaked in piano and yeah. you know the piano became the metaphor for, for everything I wanted to say there's so much to do with learning a musical instrument that's, yeah. that's fascinating so I think this is a good segue for kind of our next section we just talked about your musical um, piano training and whatnot so let's listen to a bit of a clip from some of the okay. lyrics you've worked on and then we okay. can discuss with you uh, your songwriting process the place we lived when we were young in a world of magnets and miracles our thoughts trade constantly and without boundary the ringing of the division bell had begun so how did this collaboration with <laughs> your husband begin um, he he wasn't my husband at the time, he was my boyfriend. Um, he was, um, he had gone into a, into a studio and he was jamming with Rick Wright, Nick Mason, for the first time, I think, since the 70s, that they'd played freely together. I, at the time, had what's in England called glandular fever here, I think it's called Epstein-Barr. So I was at home with a massively high temperature and he'd come back in the evenings and play me this beautiful music and then say, but yeah, I just need a lyric. Um, I was working as a journalist at the Sunday Times at the, right then. I had no, in, you know, I had, n I had no desire to be a lyricist, but I was lying there with this fever, and I would occasionally sort of say some obscure thing, kind of, oh, I just thinking about ivy growing over a door, and he would write it down. And then it, sort of these things would start sort of emerging, and so it, it kind of, he'd show me that, something and he'd say I think this would work and I'd look at it once I'd taken something to bring the fever down and I think not sure that does work quite yeah oh, let me have a little fiddle with that and so it progressed and then it became more formalized 
And at the beginning, um, he said that, you know, that he agreed that I wouldn't have to have my name on it. And I know that sounds odd, but I, I don't know, it was a, it was a different world back then. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a misogynist culture, particularly rock and roll. Pink Floyd, I don't think it had any female contributors. I had this real sort of terror that if my name was on it, I would somehow, people would start calling me Yoko Ono. Yeah. And I think about that now, <laughs> and I think, well, what would be wrong with that? I mean, she's an amazing artist. Yeah. She's an innovator. She's never stopped. She's incredible. She's a woman in her 80s who's still producing new art. So I now think, please, you know, if anyone yeah. would like to call me Yoko Ono, I'll accept <laughs> that yeah. with grace and enormous happiness. Um, but at the time, that seemed like kind of an insult yeah. and so David said okay it's fine I'll pay you and I thought yay and <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you know your name doesn't need to be on it and then by the time we'd finished he sort of said I'm sorry but you know you're, you're getting a credit your name's going on it and one day you will thank me because you know uncredited work is a horrible yeah. feeling and he was right because I'm really proud of that work and yeah. and of course now I would I would really hate it if my name wasn't on it but at the time I was a shrinking violet <laughs> yeah, again here, uh, I know David often mentions you're his muse. Yeah. Uh, for you, again, when you're writing, is there a muse that's spurring on a certain lyric one way or the other? Yeah. Or again, is it just you're walking outside yeah. with a tune in your <laughs> well, head and the then tune. composing? I mean, the, the, the muse is the tune, and so I suppose the tune has come from David. So, you know, I mean, I know it sounds a bit happy couple but I'd have to say that, you know, the muse for the lyrics is quite clearly David because the music is always first. And yeah. You know, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to write a lyric because mm -hmm. you have this prompt. You know, instead of that thing, you know, you're still, it's no, there's no blank page because it's there. The, the music is there. When I write a lyric, he, he scats a, a, a top line melody. And the scat, it feels like it's just under the surface. There are these words and it's just a matter of sort of bringing them up to the surface. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a very different process from writing something from what I think of as scratch. Yeah. yeah. Is there ever yeah. an instance where the lyrics came first and then the music later? Or? Um, I think just, just once, and that was on um, the last Pink Floyd album, um, The Endless River. And because it, it was, The Endless River was put together from that session I mentioned earlier, it, um, there were so many beautiful pieces of music and you know, 10 or 11 of them made it onto the division bell. And for years, we'd always been listening to the other bits of music, yeah. you know, and it, they were lovely. And so there came a moment where it just felt that those pieces of music should be released. And Rick had sadly died. And so I just felt awkward about imposing a lyric on something from a time when Rick was alive. Yeah. And so I didn't want to write it to a piece of music, but I knew that David wanted a song, and I knew that he wanted a song to be the big full stop on the Pink Floyd history. Yeah. So I wrote that song, the um, Louder Than Words, to sort of try and sum up the thing to do that I'd noticed most about the members of Pink Floyd, which is just how eloquently they speak to each other mm -hmm. with musical instruments, but put them in a room together, and it is the most awkward thing you can imagine. <laughs> no one speaks. Yeah. It's so yeah, so that's what that song's about. It's, about. it's about men who don't use words to speak to each other, but who have something else. Awesome, yeah, I think we're gonna listen to another clip from the solo album, uh, Rattle That Lock. This one is called In Any Tongue. Let's get the AV back up. Home and done, it's just begun. His heart weighs more, more than it ever did before. What has he done? God help my son. Hey, stay a while. I'll stay on. So obviously some very strong war motifs, the video itself as well. Tell me a little bit about the process behind this song and if it was any different from what you just mentioned. Yeah, well, this, this, this was a, in a way quite a daunting song to write and it was the last one that I wrote for Rattle That Lock and 
it was a piece of music that was so suggestive of what it had to be about. And I, for some reason, felt inhibited by the enormity of that subject, you know, the wastage of war. And so I spent a long time reading poetry, of, basically what the poetry of conscience. So, you know, poetry written by people who'd served in Afghanistan, um, a lot of different poetry. I mean, I even read the poetry of the Taliban. I wanted to sort of read a lot of poetry to do with war. And I kind of got really bogged down in it. I mean, and, and it got to the point where I couldn't write a word. And, um, and so I read more and more of these collections of poetry. And, you know, and in the end, David said, look, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You know, if it doesn't make it onto the album, it doesn't matter. You know, he's very, very good like that. And I think it was kind of the last day. And I thought, oh, it's such a great tune. I don't want to be responsible for this not going on the album. And I sat in the sunshine and just thought, why am I making such a meal of this? I know what I think. I know exactly what I think. And I think I wrote the lyric in maybe 10 minutes, once yeah. I'd given myself a firm talking to. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we want to open it up to any audience Q&A. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, now's a great time to ask Polly on everything she's talked about. We have some mics that will be coming around. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Polly, when you um, write a short story, you said you have, you sort of have the whole thing in your head. Yeah. When you're doing a novel, are you carrying <laughs> the ending in your head and then you're just letting the story progress and the characters mm -hmm. develop? You don't really know how you're going to get to the <laughs> ending and. Yeah, um, what, what the, um, it's a great question because it is very different from a short story um, writing a novel and, and I think it's very different for different sorts of novelists. I have a friend who plots the whole thing and I'm quite envious really. You go and look in her writing room and there it is, you know, chapter one, chapter two and she knows everything she's doing and it's this wonderful scaffolding and she just hangs the writing on the scaffolding. But I have to admit that that would bore me. I know who my characters are. I know what their moral problems are. I know the, choice, the moral choices they have to make. But other than that, I don't really know the ending. And things change. I mean, this, this, this method writing, that's when things change. I mean, walking as that person and thinking as that person and responding to things as that person makes the story and the, and the, and the journey to the end very different from something I might have thought I was doing in the beginning. And that's what makes it exciting, actually, for me, is, it, you know, it, 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 I like the surprises. I like the way that things I thought I was going to do just change. It's, it's you know, it's, it's endlessly surprising. Yeah. yeah. We have another question in the back. Hi. So um, songwriting is something that's always interested me. Um, as, and one of the things that's uh, I've always wondered is, you know, after a certain point, you, you become famous, right? And uh, you're living a different sort of, uh, of life than, than other people. And you're seeing things that are different than other people, than the you know, average person. Um, and how do you still, uh, yet often when artists become famous, their, their albums, not always, but become better and better and better, okay? Sometimes worse, but better and better and better. And I, I've always wondered, how do you actually continue to kind of be hungry, continue to see things from the view of non-famous people who have a very different potentially view of the world that maybe you don't have anymore and still connect mm. um, with, with people. Uh, that, that's, it's something I've, I've just always wondered. How does, how does, how does Pink Floyd or you know, yeah. David or you get down and, and still write a song today that can connect with, yeah. with us? Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't feel like I have a wall <laughs> anywhere <laughs> built between me and anyone. Um, I don't feel famous. I mean, and I'm not. Um, so I can't answer how it is to be famous and and but I do know that you know we live a very ordinary life with you know we don't we live an ordinary life our children go to school we cook we we walk we walk our dog our friends are not famous people our friends are you know I, I feel very connected I don't feel my life has changed because my husband is famous if that answers the question But it's, it's a, you know, 
I, when you first start writing, when you're first writing songs, your yeah. your you're just your financial position, your view of the world, and everything yeah. has got to be very different than yeah. once you have whether whether it's specifically you, this famous, or yeah. that that the okay. world that you're living. It's a very very different world. Okay. And I, I mean, I don't know. Like, comfortably yeah. numb was written about you know being on on tour or something like that, yeah. know, something like this. You know, yeah. ha, th that's a that's something that most of us don't. It's it's a great no. song, but it's something most of us don't have. No. I guess it's kind of how do you still Okay. How do you think you can still connect to people? Okay, um, well, there's one, one word answer to that, and it's, and it's the most important thing that a writer needs to possess, and it's empathy. So, you know, it's what I talked about. It's, about, it's like method writing. You know, it is about being able to get under anyone's skin. And, you know, I don't think there's a writer alive who hasn't got empathy as their greatest skill. I mean, and if they haven't, they shouldn't be writing. Another question here. So I'll preface this, I'm not a published author, but I really uh, I understand your, your method uh, writing that you were discussing, that, that's kind of exactly how I do stuff. But when I do that, I find that for every one finished product that's like good and goes somewhere that's clever and you know other people might want to read it, there's probably at least five to nine other things that like, eh, it kind of petered out, it didn't work. So you have two published novels now. I was wondering how many did you start writing that just didn't go anywhere or are you able to salvage them somehow? Um, You've got to silence your inner critic, because you know you say there are eight or nine that are not working, but that's that's your inner critic is telling you that, and maybe your inner critic is being too harsh with you. Just a thought. Um, I don't have a load of stuff that I've started, and I tend to kind of if, if I start something, I finish it, but I take a long time to start something. I have to know that that you know it's going to take time, it's going to take energy and it's going to be obsessional. So I have to know that I'm jumping into the right pool um, before I take the leap. Um, I've written one novel that didn't reach full gestation. Uh, it got to about 20,000 words, and my inner critic was deafening. And actually, I found it on a, a old drive the other day, and my inner critic on that occasion was correct. It was terrible. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, I think it's about starting the right thing, um, if that's any help. That kind of segues to my next question yeah. in terms of what's next for you? Another novel, another short story collection? Um, hey. I'm, I'm, I, what's next for me is another novel. Um, I've got three novels kind of float. This is the thing about selecting the right thing. There are three ideas kind of flying around out there, and it's which one to land. I, no idea at the moment. And I can't wait to just pick on one, because then, then you, again, you, know, you can get into that total obsession, tunnel vision and think about nothing but that, research nothing but that, and that is the greatest state. Um, and I also want to write some more lyrics, but I can't do both things at once. I need to have just one thing in my head at a time. Yeah. So I'm, at this moment, I'm not sure if it's lyrics next or novel next. Yeah. We'll see. And outside of writing, I know photography is a big passion. What yeah. else kind of drives you? Well, photography is a big passion because I'm not a natural photographer. I'd say that because I've always written and it is the thing I, you know, it's, it, you know for most of my life, it, has, it defined me yeah. writing. And photography doesn't come naturally to me. So I love something that I have to really work at and, and, and I love learning and the piano is the same thing. I like things that are incremental. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've had all sorts of things that, you know, I can juggle. And that, again, is a kind of incremental learning thing. And um, yeah, and I still play the piano, and I play guitar. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but my passion is writing. Great, yeah. great. Uh, are there any other audience questions? So we're going to start off uh, with Polly reading a little bit, uh, one short passage from The Kindness. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to simply read the first three pages. Just it's set in August 1989, this bit, although the novel spans 23 years. Lucifer flew well for her in the fading light, falling through the sky when she summoned him and away again towards a great bruising sunset. She was alone on the ridge at first, just her, the bird, and the wide open view. It was one of those nervy summer days of sudden strong winds that fretted the hawk's feathers as he stared at her from his perch on her gauntlet. She was wearing a long red shirt over jeans and sandals. Her hair was breaking free of its band. A leather pouch hung from her belt and a whistle from a cord around her neck. The hawk braced his feet on her wrist, making a leather tassel swing from the gauntlet. 
She felt the breath of his feathers on her face as he departed, and she watched him go with the wind right under his wings, scattering crows like shot drops shaken from an umbrella. Julia was trying her best to get it right for the bird. The morsels were small to keep him active. A shaming 26 ounces he'd weighed on the scales that morning. She called him with a whistle, two sharp bursts, and there he was, a dark Cupid's bow firing straight at her from the heavens. She continued along the ridge, Lucifer steady on her arm, his manic eyes never leaving her face until she gave the signal. She sent him reeling to and fro, and neither of them knew that this was to be their last dance. The evening started to chill. She'd almost forgotten that Julian was supposed to be meeting her there, or perhaps she'd just given up hope. He was panting when he arrived, still red in the face from the run up the hill, his bike and its useless tyre abandoned. He had the air of a boy who'd crossed three continents to see her, his sweatshirt knotted round his waist. Impossibly young, with hair falling over his eyes and an uncertain lope, one leg of his jeans still tucked into a sock. He didn't dare kiss her, he said, with the hawk glaring at him like that from the end of her wrist. The hawk shrugged his shoulders and she sent him flying. They kissed, and when Julian stopped to glance nervously at the sky, she took off her gauntlet and pushed his hand inside. She urged the hawk with her whistle, moving Julian's arm up and down, the gauntlet's tassel dancing. But Lucifer only soared higher, the wind whispering murder into his ear and deafening him to her call. Julia ran cursing, Julian lolloping beside her. She grabbed back the gauntlet and as the hawk fell to his kill, Julian's hands were warm on her waist and it seemed to them both that the scream of the rabbit went on forever. It was almost midnight when she got back to Witchwood. She just stayed at Julian's digs until morning if it hadn't been for Lucifer, bloody bird. She parked the car in the lane, coaxed him from his crate and clipped him on. Lucifer shook out his feathers, a little irked that somebody had carelessly creased his cape. Fallen twigs cracked underfoot as she cut through the copse, the bird a resentful weight on her arm, the accusatory glitter of his eyes, the only brightness beneath the trees. The darkness dropped, the branches stilled. Witchwood stood alone in the clearing, as unexpected as a Grimm's brother's cottage with its wonky blackboards and crooked windows. At once she could see a light was on, though she was certain she'd switched everything off. Her face owlish white, Julia slipped through the back gate, whispering to Lucifer as she transferred him to his post in the shed and on alone up the path. Heart beating, a skittering stone loose at the steps, she pushed the the, the door open with her foot and straight into the kitchen. A gasp, mostly relief. Chris, her husband, streaky hair flat to his head, his giant grey trainers kicked halfway across the floor, chinkering his spoon in a cup. She took half a pace back. Why the look of surprise, he said. I live here too, you know. Maggie, his lurcher, quivered in disgust beside him, her nose pressed to his knee. So here I am, home, he made a mockery of the word, bristling with it, pointing his spoon at her like a weapon. I wasn't expecting you. She hung the leather gauntlet on its hook, brain racing for an alibi and stalling. You gave me a fright. You could have been anybody. He cursed her for the welcome, bearing teeth older than his mouth, Nescafe and tobacco. What did you do? Did you leave Lucifer in the boot while you... I couldn't get the car to start. He snatched the leather pouch from her and threw the leftover bits of meat to his dog, then pulled it inside out. If you don't clean it out, there'll be maggots again. He was supposed to be away until Christmas, by which time Julia had promised herself to be gone. His overalls fell open to a Ramones t-shirt so faded you'd have to already know the name of the band and down to a belt with a large metal buckle. He unloaded his pockets over the kitchen counter. Tobacco, Murray mints, rolling papers, dope tin, change clattering. His hair was dotted with grey paint like flies had been laying eggs in it. It's great you're so pleased to see me, he said. A real treat. Likewise. I'll leave it there. <laughs> All right, I think we'll segue then to the second reading okay. uh, from The Perfect Lives. Uh, everybody join me in giving a great round of applause. Okay. Ms. Polly Sampson. Thank you. 
So um, the thing to say about this is I've, I've, I've sort of taken a few little bits of one story um, and talking about real life influencing something you might write. When I wrote this story, or just before I wrote it, I had three friends, three wonderful, wonderful women who are married to really, really boring men. And these really boring men left these wonderful women for other women. And these women who, who sort of were, had seemed to have tired of these boring men all became stalkers of their ex-husbands. And they would all tell me about it. And it was the material was just too good to waste. And, um, you know, the internet makes stalkers of all of us. So, yeah. Anyway, it's called Morgana. Morgana burst into my life, jingling and jangling armfuls of bracelets and puffing thin cigarettes that she rolled herself. Silk flowers scattered here and there in twists of dark hair, fresh from her crisis and still prone to sudden tears. My shoulders were not the kind that usually got cried on, a bit on the tense side, I suppose, what with Simon working all the time and Angus and Ivan like leaky buckets, never full no matter how much I poured into them. Morgana's fandango, what a nightmare. Things being thrown, hot cups of tea across the kitchen, Mike's clothes into Marine Parade, the photographs of their wedding day removed from the top of the piano, put back again twice and removed again with such force that the glass shattered in the frames. She was wild when he left, a river of tears washing over a fortnight's dismal blowjobs that failed to make him stay. She put half a brick through the window of the basement he was renting one night when he wouldn't open the door. His girlfriend Elizabeth, who he pretended didn't live there with him at all, looked up from playing her oboe, straight at Morgana outside on the pavement, and laying the oboe carefully down, raised her arms to release a long skein of hair from its band, sending it falling and swinging down her back like molten metal, and sashayed to the telephone to call the police. Morgana's driving is not improved when she tells me about these things. I had, though not without misgiving, agreed to put my life in Morgana's hands a couple of afternoons a week. She was quite bold when she suggested it. Mike did all the driving, she told me one afternoon when I'd come with my films to the studio she ran from the basement of her house. After 29 years in the passenger seat, I'll be needing to brush up. I never even got to touch the radio in our car, and the steering wheel was most definitely out of bounds, she said the first time she sat clutching my car's wheel. I'm sure I could drive. I've definitely got a license, and I can remember taking a red mini moke right up the middle of Portobello Market. I was in awe of her then. I was nervous when she developed my films and printed my pictures, worrying that my composition was not good or the exposures ill-judged. She made prints for the best of them. There was glamour to her. She was festooned with it, all those bracelets she wore, the layers of fine fabrics, the charms and old meaningful rings that hung from her neck, clustered together on a long gold chain, the hints of a rackety life once lived up and down the King's Road. I called for her on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2.30 in the afternoon, so we had a clear hour to mow down pedestrians before I had to collect my leaky, pair of leaky buckets from their school. Sometimes I could feel my poor Peugeot quake, a variety of stimuli could set Morgana off. An alabaster statuette spied through his window, flaunting its nakedness atop his new desk. Do you suppose it reminds him of her? CDs, a book spotted lying on the back seat of his car, a thick one with an irritating title. The man on the cover looked to be in fear of his life, she said, rattling my keys at the ignition irritably. What's he doing reading self-help books? Sometimes, Morgana told me, she couldn't sleep at night, and in the darkness she tiptoed, quite undetected, through the perfumed gardens of Elizabeth's Facebook. Elizabeth seemed to have accepted Morgana's alter ego as a friend. I said it just proved how few friends she had in the real world. Bang outside Mike's flat and into a space either directly behind or directly in front of his car always seemed to, be to Morgana to be the perfect place to practice parking. The cur curtains were drawn at the front. They had been since the last time he'd allowed her over the threshold and much to Elizabeth's displeasure and Morgana's later mortification, she and Mike had ended up wrestling on the floor like bad children. Once parked, Morgana was able to nip out and search for those little sharp nuggets of information that she so craved, peering through the windows of his black Audi. I watched her with her hands against the glass of the car that had once been her chariot 
and cringed as I imagined Elizabeth or Mike seeing her there. Awaken the giant within! What's that supposed to mean? When did he ever read books like that? She huffed as we pulled away in a series of ostrich jerks. Mirrors! Mirrors! I yelled. Silly little girl must be telling him what to read. Self-help! Her bracelets jangled as she thumped the steering wheel for emphasis. He never had any trouble helping himself, ignoring the hooting from the car behind. What do you suppose I did to his giant anyway to put it to sleep? She scraped the gears as she changed into third. Sorry, she said to me and to the man who'd overtaken, shaking his head. And he's listening to the ting-tings. What's he doing listening to the ting-tings? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody.